hosting with us um, and she's going to tell us about her guest but I'm going to give a short intro before that. Um, a new baby always seems like a miracle but the science of life is very real. With every new life we welcome into this world, we also welcome a new chance at saving another life through the power of umbilical cord blood donation. Right. Yes. Yes, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Yes, we are going to talk about in detail about the cord blood. And before we go to our professionals, let's invite our guest, um, Harsha, and her dad. Actually, her dad recently celebrated his sixth birthday. What do you mean? How can he celebrate six birthday? He's Harsha's dad. <laughs> you took off like what? How many decades of him? 60. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, uncle was diagnosed with leukemia uh, six years ago, and he received cord blood transplant. Oh, wow. That gave him new life. That's so amazing. it is actually his rebirth. Wow. So he celebrated his sixth rebirth today. Oh, amazing. That's awesome. So let's hear th their story from them only. Yeah, sure. So let's welcome Harsha and Praveen Bhai. Hello. Hello. Hi. There we go. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Hello. Welcome to Good our fun. show. Thank you. Hey, Thank Arsha. you. Good to be here. Hey. So, um, hello, Uncle. Welcome to Chai yes. Time. And yes. first of all, happy rebirth day. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. tell us about your celebration. Oh, celebration. Uh, I, I'm six years old now. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that is wonderful. So, Harsha, I, I thought, yes, uh, tell us, uh, when did you find out that you needed the cord blood transplant? So, my dad, uh, he lives in California. I'm here in Houston. And he was, I remember getting the phone call, he, um, that he was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of AML. Um, and, you know, right away I went over there and my family, we... we got all the facts and we were super worried about what was going to happen. And um, when we found out about the cord blood, it was after his treatment began. And the doctors had told us basically during his chemotherapy treatment, they told us that um, by the time his chemo rounds ended, which would be roughly about three months, um, three to four months that by the end of that, he would need to have um, found a match in order for him to have transplant a few months later. Um, and if not, that that his um, cancer would come back and it would come back a very like with a vengeance. That was the word that they used. Oh, wow. um, and he would not survive it. It was like a 90, 99 percent um, chance that he would get it back and it would be really bad. So, so that's uh, how we found out. Uh -huh. So, uh, uncle was diagnosed with leukemia and he needed basically a bone marrow transplant, right? Correct. And yes. you needed to find a donor. That's why, um, that before the, after the chemotherapy, he needed a bone marrow transplant from a matching donor, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. I remember that you guys did a lot of drives um, to find a donor. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I know that could not find a donor, but uh, then, uh, he ended up receiving the cord blood transplant. And yeah. uh, so did you do something to find a cord blood donor? We didn't. Um, we didn't know, to, I'll be so honest with you, we didn't know about the cord blood registry. We were told about Be The Match and we were um, connected with Be The Match through the Stanford Hospital, um, you know, which was the doctor, the oncologist there is the one that guided us kind of through the process of um, what needed to happen with the bone marrow transplant. Um, but we didn't know about the cord blood. I wish I had known about that. Um, it was when it was after after uh, when they started their search with looking for a match and, um, you know, he didn't find a match through the, through the registry. And that is when they called us and told us that they did, you know, that he did find two matches in the cord blood. And that's when we first really kind of learned about that. Um, and then we started reading, reading more about it and educating ourselves about that process. Okay, I'm so glad. So do you know anything about, um, about your cord bloods from where you got? Dad, I'll let you answer this one. Yeah, one, we find it in the United States. 
Mm-hmm. Wow. And one we find it in a, another country. They don't tell us which country. Oh, wow. Wow. But one in another country and one in America. Wow. wow. So two mothers donated. Oh, wow. wow. That's just amazing. That is. Yeah. Uh, really yeah. awesome and just to think um when we first found out i mean i i have two boys and i just wished so bad that i could turn back the clock to know about this so that i could have donated my cord blood yes and um you know i just i'm so ever ever grateful to these two moms that because of them i you know i have my father today yeah it is I told I told a guy the exact same thing. I wish I knew this. I remember getting yes. the form but I didn't know the importance of it, you know. Right. So I'm so glad we're getting the chance to talk about it and creating awareness. Awareness. And yes. um, yeah. So important. It is so good to know that uncle is doing well. And thank you so much for sharing your story mm-hmm. and that shows hope to so many others who are still waiting for a match. So um thank you so much and once again happy birthday yes, uncle happy, happy birthday, birthday. Now, thank you it, thank you since it's the 6th birthday you can have as many candies you want yes. right <laughs> <laughs> no one's stopping you <laughs> all right once again thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you for taking the time thank you bye 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 hi so now we'll have uh, our second guest Eric Karnar manager of cord blood program be the match national marrow donor program mm-hmm. welcome eric hi thank you so much for having me thanks for joining us and uh, erica tell us more about cord blood banking um actually before you we have another um, guest they shared uh, their story um he uh, uh, praveen bhai is in his 60s and he received cord blood transplant 6 years ago and he's doing well so now we want to know more about the cord blood donation so tell us about cord blood donation please oh gladly i will i was listening in to by the way and oh, okay. just Wonderful. loving hearing their story i couldn't help but smile i love how you said i am 6 years old right? yeah. yes <laughs> yeah oh so i just uh, you know Uh, every uh, those stories are just they touch the heart and i just oh i love it i love it so thank you both and thank you to this um team of women putting together this terrific this terrific radio show to talk about things that we i love talking about cord blood so thank you for thank having you. me thank you thank <laughs> you for taking the time oh yeah so i'm so glad to be here so so you asked a little bit about cord blood banking and what cord blood is and i i can start there and then um just you know fill in other um questions uh, answers to questions you might have but cord blood is actually when we think about cord blood it's the it's the blood that's remaining in the umbilical cord and the placenta after the birth of the baby so that cord blood uh in the umbilical cord that cord blood contains stem cells that grow into blood and immune system cells and other types of cells as well and so today that cord blood is used um often as a substitute for a bone marrow or stem cell transplant many mm-hmm. times if there's a patient that's looking and and may have a challenging time finding an unrelated donor cord blood is always an option for them as well mm-hmm. uh, often an option for them and cord blood today um actually is treating over 80 diseases including cancers and blood disorders genetic and metabolic disorders um as well and so you know these these mothers parents that donate their cord blood to the public inventory to be listed um on be the match and searchable for patients they are giving so much hope to searching patients it's just fantastic so it's it's just this amazing it's this amazing wonderful altruistic opportunity for parents and babies as one of their very first things they do together mm-hmm. as a team mm-hmm. to donate this umbilical cord blood uh to to sit on our registry and wait for a patient that's looking. That is, so that's kind of a high level yes. overview of what yeah. what cord blood is in general. That yeah. is great. And something that's going to be wasted like can actually save somebody's life. We just heard that story. It gives me the goosebumps, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. I know. So I know. It, it is. It's medical waste. So yeah. When so you... the fact that we have this wonderful infrastructure in the United States and, and globally quite frankly 
that supports the ability for parents to explore public donation of their cord blood unit is really just, it's really fantastic. And right now, um, you know, we have, uh, we have a sort of a process associated with public donation. Moms uh, and parents, they sign an informed consent mm-hmm. and um, which gives the public cord blood banks, our, our cord blood banks that, that partner with Be The Match and, and collect cord blood units to be listed on our inventory. Uh, they get permission from these parents and, and these moms to collect that cord blood right after the birth mm-hmm. of the baby and then process and prepare that cord blood for storage. And then all of the details associated with that particular unit are then listed in our Be The Match database in a variety of different um, areas and they're searchable. Wow. by doctors wow. uh, for yes. on behalf of patients. Wow. Yeah. And uh, Erica, how many uh, cord blood units are in national and international databases? I mean, right now we have um, available for patients searching. We've got uh, on our Be The Match sort of upfront list. And, and so that's kind of a fancy way of saying, you know, if a patient comes to us, it's, it's this key mm-hmm. main list that they get. They've got close to uh, 500,000, half a million cord wow. blood units that, are, that they can search through Be The Match um, specifically, kind of on this um, direct search. But then globally, we have relationships and partnerships with all of the additional public cord blood banks uh, a- across the world, which is wow. amazing, this wow. big network of, of folks that are partnering together on behalf of patients. And if we count all of those, uh, we have a, over... 800,000 cord blood units wow. available for searching patients. Yes. Yeah. That is awesome. So basically, if patient is in need, so those units are already available. Mm-hmm. If somebody matches, um, that could, could be easily available for the mm-hmm. patients. Wow. Yes, they, that's, yes, that's exactly right. So when a, when a patient finds themselves in a situation where they need to search the registry for a cord blood unit, they, they will come to be the match. A domestic patient here in the United States will come to be the match. And through the, the searching that we offer and the partnerships with other uh, registries across the globe, mm-hmm. they have access to over 800,000 units. Okay, um, so in that, I do have one more question. So if a patient in U.S. and is in need of the cord blood transplant, so the patient's doctor reach out to you and you connect with international registries or it becomes patient's responsibility to connect with international registries? Really great question. It kind of depends on the relationship and the partnership that, that Be The Match has with that particular international registry. There's there's a lot of different uh, formulas and relationships that we have with different folks across the globe. But really, uh, the high-level process is that uh, a patient's physician would would search Be The Match, and in, our, in partnership with Be The Match, we'd help them track down and identify appropriate mm-hmm. graft sources and cord blood units specifically that they could look into a bit further and help facilitate that connection between the uh, registries as well, if they are an international registry. Okay. So we do, we kind of serve as the, as the middleman to some degree uh, to, to connect the patients with their, with their cord blood unit. That is so good to know. So that it is not patient's responsibility. Yeah. Patients are already overwhelmed mm, yeah. and to deal with situation. And at least they don't need to worry about yeah. to look for the different, connect with the different registries so yeah. be the match is exactly. there to yeah. help them internationally so you all are the liaison between the that's, patient and the that's exactly right yeah. the liaison yes yeah. we're we coordinate and facilitate uh, additional testing that might be needed to find out which particular cord blood unit would be the real the, the right selection for that particular patient and their indication we help with the logistics associated with transporting that particular cord blood unit to the patient on time Um, and available for when the patient needs it. And we collect the outcomes data associated with that transplant Mm -hmm. to uh, continue to gather that data and facilitate uh, uh, research studies to help us get better and better at what we do as a a transplant community in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. And one more question, um, Erika. Is ethnicity or race important in this process? It is. You know, it really is. Um, 
genetic typing that's used to match a, a patient in a cord blood unit is so much more complex than matching a, just a blood type. And so typically patients uh, are most likely to match cord blood units who share their same ethnic background wow. because of these genetic traits used to determine um, a match they're inherited. And so it's really, really important to be the match and, and it's kind of woven into the fabric of, of uh, everything we do to continue to build uh, a diverse, a really rich registry with a lot of different representation of individuals, um, racial background and ethnic background. Um, and we really want to be able to extend transplant to anybody who needs it. And so building an ethnically diverse registry of cord blood units is really, really important. But I will say from a cord blood unit perspective, one of the beautiful pieces of the cord blood um, itself is that it allows patients to cross HLA barriers. So, so part of the beauty of the cord blood uh, transplant isn't even so much in the match. Sometimes it's in the mismatch. So we have a great opportunity with cord blood, which is um, obviously derived from the umbilical cord, m very naive cells, right? Yes. Um, that these cord blood units and, and the level of match um, doesn't have to be as strong as, as if you were um, using an unrelated donor for a patient. And that's a really wonderful, yeah, wonderful way for us so to yeah, serve yeah. patients in need. Yeah. yeah. Obviously. Uh, so my understanding is right, doesn't have to be 100% mad. Yes, I think so. Yes, Erica? Uh, yes, for cord blood, it does not. You know, it depends mm -hmm. on the transplant uh -huh. center. It depends on the protocol that they're using to facilitate the transplant itself. Mm -hmm. But there, the, the mismatch opportunity and the opportunity to leverage a cord blood unit with a with with a patient, um, given a certain degree of mismatch, is absolutely um, practiced today by many many transplant centers. That's mm -hmm. very interesting. That is yeah. wow, and it is so important for patients to have that available, and it doesn't have to be perfect match. So it provides them more possibility to yes. find a donor. donor that yeah. is wonderful. And uh, uh, one more question, Erica, before you leave, uh, that uh, will you tell us who to contact if the moms want to donate? So where to contact them? Great question. Uh, so there's a couple different places you can go. I, I would say uh, parents should have an initial conversation with their care provider mm -hmm. to find out if they've got any information available uh, around public donation. Our Be The Match website is a wonderful spot to go. And okay. you can search for cord blood and find collecting hospitals that are partnered with our our public member cord blood banks to so see if the place you're delivering is indeed a collecting hospital. Okay, so these banks are available uh, in all cities or in some particular cities? They are not. Right now we've got 16 uh, cord blood banks in the United States that mm -hmm. are uh, in our network. And so they're not, obviously, they're not located um, in every state, mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily mean that they may not have collecting hospitals that are represented in other states. So uh, I think that having parents explore an opportunity to donate um, and looking at the Be The Match website is a really great place to start. And you can reach out to Be The Match. We get lots of great questions from parents on a weekly basis uh, around this exact topic. and. And the cord blood program team is, is eager to, to connect with those parents and, and give them any information we have available to help them to support them in, in their interest for donation. Mm -hmm. And if there's no opportunity to donate, I'm telling you, there's so many other really terrific ways to partner with Be The Match. So, oh. <laughs> so wow. yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing such valuable information. And we really appreciate your time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Oh, that was such thank great you both. information. Yes. Oh. Yes, you guys have a wonderful day. Take you care. Too. You too. Bye-bye. We're going to go on a quick break, and once we come back, we have two other guests lined up. So From MD Anderson, Dr. Chitra Hossing, and uh, Crystal Moon um, from the Cord Blood Banking, MD Anderson. Oh, wow. So can't wait to finish the conversation. Welcome back to Chai Time on 99.5 FM. For anyone who's just joining in, we are having this enlightening conversation about 
the importance and the significance of cord blood donation um, I'm gonna give it to Gayatri and she's gonna introduce our guest right yeah thanks Nella and we have our next guest from MD Anderson mm -hmm. cord blood bank Crystal who's the manager of cord blood bank and Dr. Ho Singh uh, stem cell transplantation from Texas Children MD Anderson Wow uh, welcome Crystal and Dr. Ho Singh Thank you for having us. We're so excited and thank you so much. I know you all must be very busy, but thank you so much for your time. And before you, we learned from Erica about the cord blood banking and we learned that we have a cord blood bank here that is MD Anderson. So tell us more about MD Anderson cord blood bank. Yeah, glad to. Um, but first of all, I would like to congratulate Praveen Bhai and Harsha Patel mm -hmm. on their sixth year anniversary very commendable and congratulations to thank both you. of them thank um, you yeah so our cord blood bank here at md anderson is housed in the stem cell transplant and cellular therapy department so not only do we have a cord blood bank but we use quite a few of our units for transplantation in our patients um, it was established back in 2005 and it has been one of the fastest growing public cord blood banks in the United States, and we are now the second largest in the United States. So we are very proud of that. Wow. Also, yeah. So currently we have close to 40,000 cord blood units in our inventory. Wow. And what is more amazing is that over two thirds of the inventory consists of minority units. Wow. Yeah. So as you heard, it is sometimes more difficult to find a fully matched donor in the registry mm -hmm. for ethnic uh, minorities, uh, Asians, Hispanics, African Americans. So we are very proud that our bank has so many, uh, you know, minority units. That is so good to know. And if yeah. one of your unit matches somebody outside of Houston or outside of US, you will be able to transport that too, right? Yes. So the units that are currently stored in our bank are available for any uh, transplant physician or any transplant recipient around the world. Wow, that is so good. So mm -hmm. the moms or the families in <coughs> Houston mm -hmm. donate these cord blood can help their families or their countries back yeah. over there. Yeah. That's wonderful. That is so good to know. So if a South Asian mom donates here in Houston, somebody in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, all those countries can also get benefit from here. That's wonderful to know. So uh, uh, we learned in the beginning from Praveen Bhai that he received two cord blood transplants. So could you please tell us more about it? What is the significance of having two different units? So um, the success of cord blood transplant depends on the g matching grade, as Erica was saying, and the number of cells in the cord blood unit that are transplanted, uh, often called as number of stem cells or total nucleated cells. So what happens is, as you know, the number of stem cells or cells in a cord blood unit are limited because the baby is quite small when it's born. <laughs> so... Um, if you're going to transplant an adult, pretty much anybody who's over 40 kilos, mm -hmm. you would need two cord blood units to make up the cell dose. Okay. Uh, if you are a baby needing a cord blood transplant or a young adult, sometimes you can get by with only one unit. Oh. But pretty much all adults will need two units. Okay, okay, that's good to know. And are there any side effects of donating cord blood? Does it interfere with childbirth or bonding between mom and child? It should not. Uh, again, as Erica mentioned, cord blood is the uh, you know blood that remains in the placenta and, and the umbilical cord after the baby is born and the cord has been clamped. So we collect the blood that is going to be na uh, normally discarded as medical waste. Mm -hmm. And all our cord blood collectors, and Crystal is here, she's the manager, mm -hmm. they know that if there is any complication in the baby or the mother that we will not collect the cord blood unit. So it is very important that the safety of the baby and the mother is our topmost priority. 
Okay, that oh, is yeah. so good to know. That, that gives yeah. you, you know, comfort yeah. that okay, you know, you are in safe hands, hands yes. and secondly, you will be able to save someone's yeah. life. Yeah. yeah, if meshed. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I understand that all the units are not used, but uh, if meshed, it then it is given to the patient, mm-hmm. right, Doctor Jose? Correct. Okay, great. So, how long a unit can be so stored? So, complete units can be stored. For over 20 years, wow. as long as they're stored properly, yes. Oh, wow. That is a pretty long life. That is a very long life. <laughs> they have a long shelf life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, at MD Anderson, how does it work? Do you reach out to all pregnant women that come to MD Anderson or you have other partnering hospitals? So how does this, uh, the whole thing works? So Crystal's going to take that one. Okay. Hello, how is everyone doing? Good, so glad to have you here. Thank you, I'm great to be here. Um, So, no, unfortunately we don't get to approach every single mother. MD Anderson does not have a labor and delivery department. So, we partner with hospitals outside of MD Anderson. Um, We have partnerships with multiple hospitals here and outside of the state of Texas. Um, We approach mothers on the floor. We have a special program because our staff is actually on site and they get to meet with the mothers, recruit them, um, and and be there for the uh, for the collection of the court blood. Wow! So, uh, could you give us a few names of the hospitals in in Houston that collect the court blood units? Yes. Um, so we have a partnership with Memorial Hermann, and we are with three other hospitals right now. That's Memorial Hermann Southwest, Memorial Hermann, uh, excuse me, in the Woodlands, oh, Memorial wow. Hermann in Memorial City. And we also have a collection site at the Texas Medical Center location also. Mm-hmm. Um, we also partner with Bentop General Hospital, St. Joseph's Medical Center, and the Woman's Hospital of Texas, which is one of our biggest sites. Mm. Wow. So all the moms who are delivering babies in these hospitals have access to donate umbilical cord blood. Mm-hmm. Yes. All those that are interested. Okay, great. And is there any cost associated with it? No, core blood collection, well, it depends on what you choose and how you choose to store it. We are a public core blood bank, so it's primarily and only donation. Mm-hmm. Um, in the case that families are interested in uh, saving it specifically for themselves, then they would have to reach out to a private bank. Mm-hmm. Okay, so where can we find out the list of the partnering hospitals in Houston? On the MD Anderson website or that information is available somewhere else as well? Um, there are multiple places you can find it. There's, of course, MD Anderson. We have a Core Blood Bank website, but you can go to mdanderson.org, and it's going to be under the donors section. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also partner with Be The Match. So Be The Match offers a, um, on their website a way to look for all the collect Core Blood Banks within the U.S. Oh, um, and then there's also a website called Parent Guide, mm-hmm. and they have a, also a list of all the Core Blood Banks in the U.S. as well. Wow, mm-hmm. that is good to know that we uh, we can have all that information. Yes. That is really great. And are, is there any medical guideline, like every pregnant woman that comes to these hospital eligible to donate, or there are some medical guidelines? Um, well, unfortunately, no, everyone is not able to uh, donate. We have limitations such as they need to be at least 34 weeks of gestation or more. Um, they need to be 18 and older. The baby should not have any fetal abnormalities, uh, no, his, no history of cancer for the mother or the father, mm. and no infectious diseases. And also, we only collect at this time from single birth. Okay. Okay. And uh, any restrictions if, if the parents have moved from different city? Or different country. For example, like over here, we uh, in Houston, we have a lot of immigrant mm-hmm. families. Um, these have lived in India or Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and and after that, they moved here. Maybe four or five years later, mm-hmm. then they plan the babies. So, are these families eligible for donation? Depends on the time that they've been away from the countries. If we refer to CDC, to the CDC for their malaria information. Mm-hmm. So, of course, there are some things like malaria and Zika. Um, and as different viruses arise, <laughs> we have to adjust our, our how we approach and determine a suitability for the mom. So, yes, there are some limitations when it comes to travel 
and even residency in other countries. Okay, suppose a mom has lived here continuously for five years, but uh -huh. was raised in India. So whether, and doesn't have any health condition, whether this mom is eligible to donate or? Mm -hmm. Yes, she would be eligible. Um, the limitation will be if she lived in India, mm -hmm. then she would need to be here more than three years. More than okay. three yeah. years, okay. Mm -hmm. And if the mom has traveled in uh, back in India, uh, back to India in last two years or so, just travel maybe for a few days. Whether that makes still her eligible or it put in the another category? Well, it gets a little complex there, but it depends. <laughs> so if she's been here for let's say uh, more than three years mm -hmm. and then are out of the out of a malaria risk area for more than three years mm -hmm. and she returns to India, then she would just need at least one year from that, okay. from the date that she returned to be eligible to donate. Just In the case it. that she returned within those three years, then that extends her um, eligibility for another three years from the date that she returned. Okay. okay. So most of the people, the immigrant over here, they live in India on one of those South Asian countries. They come here and probably they live here for three, yeah. four, five years. Then they have a baby. And in between, if they have traveled India maybe more than a year ago, then they are eligible yes. for this donation if they don't have any other medical yes. issues, right? That's what's right. That's correct. That's just wonderful. And uh, Crystal, last time you mentioned about hybrid donation. Could you tell us more about that? I know there are some banks where you need to pay for it, but when it comes to donation, the families do not need to pay anything, right? So, um, you know, we are a public bank. We do not have a model of charging for the donations. So we are currently not a hybrid bank. There are some in the United States, and I know it's very popular in India and Pakistan and other countries. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, the mom will donate initially to a private bank. Uh, they will go ahead and pay uh, whatever is required. And after two to three years, if it's not being used, whatever is the guidelines, then they will transfer it to a public bank. Uh, unfortunately, it becomes too complicated uh, for us to manage that, being a state institution and a, pri a public bank. Mm -hmm. So we currently do not have that model. Mm -hmm. However, I want to just mention this, that if a mom donates their baby's cord blood unit to our bank as a public bank, uh, and then two years down the road, it's required for transplanting their sibling or the baby and it's medically appropriate to use that unit. If that unit is still available in our bank, we will provide it to the mom through wow. the transplant physician. So, of course, we are not get, going to give that, it to uh, the mom to take it, but we will provide it uh, by prescription of the transplant physician. Wow. So, basically, it could be alternative. The moms who wants to donate but do not want to pay, um, they can donate for the public yes. bank. And in case these families need those in future, if they're still available, okay. that could be used. That yes. is a good alternative to yeah. a, a personal banking, right? basically. That sounds like a win-win to me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's what we feel. Yeah. And you know, the chances of a baby needing their own cord blood unit for transplant, have, the odds have been estimated at one in 4,000 or even less than that. So the chances are that your baby will not need the cord blood unit for transplant for themselves. Mm -hmm. And if it is needed for their mother or some older relative, then as you heard before, one unit is not going to be sufficient anyway. Yeah. So I think the public banking is a good option. Mm -hmm. um, there are some uh, advantages to private banking, only one that we could think of, and that is if you already have an existing child with a genetic disorder that is known to require a transplant, then you can store your other baby's cord blood unit for that sibling. But that is the only scenario that comes to mind where you would bank directly for that sibling or that baby. Uh, and uh, one more question uh, regarding that. Some I heard somewhere that if you have saved your one baby's cord blood, um, it is recommended not to save the another one or don or give it for out for donation is that correct or it is just to encourage people for the donation 
Yeah, I think it's just for donation. I mean, we have several moms who donate all their babies' cord blood units to our bank. Wow, wow. So, and you said that you have 40,000. Close to 40,000, 40, yes. units. Majority, just in majority minority units, yes. That is wonderful. Like, you, um, Houston is oil and gas. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so a lot of different ethnic groups yeah. are here. Yeah. So if these people donate, so many families back home yeah. could get benefit of that. Absolutely. And like, you know, uh, even here, because we are such a diverse population, right? So, yes. yeah, because there are so many different ethnicities, not only uh, worldwide, but here itself. Here itself, them. it's, yeah, yeah a lot. Uh, Unfortunately, we are getting to know more and more people getting affected with blood disorders and blood uh, blood diseases like cancer, and they can get cured with uh, umbilical cord blood. That is that is so awesome. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. And uh, so I would like to know, are there any obstacles you face to connect with new mothers? Um, one of our big obstacles is having the, um, I guess, the access. We are our biggest thing right now with our corporate bank is to expand. Uh, we want to be available wherever moms are delivering. And so the best place for us to do is do it at all the hospitals within Houston because we are such a diverse population. Um, the other obstacle is that well, to connect with the mothers, it's not really, I mean, we use all of our avenues. We have um, a website. We meet with a lot of physicians. Um, and so there's the opportunity, but the biggest thing right now is just to expand and be available in all the hospitals in Houston. So uh, this information is available to moms to different places or if they come to one of your partnering hospitals, then only that information is available? Yes, that's are, correct. So any pen prints or something like that is available to any other uh, places or not? So, um, you know, we distribute our pamphlets to mainly uh, doctor's offices where we partner with. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but the information for donation is available on our website and on, uh, you know, Be The Match and uh, Parent Source. So mm -hmm. the problem is, you know, they're, we are not able to staff all the hospitals currently. Of course, it's, uh, you know, staffing and, of course, financial issue. We would like to be in all the hospitals where they uh, deliver babies and collect all the cord blood mm -hmm. units we can, but it's not possible currently. Mm -hmm. um, mm. In the past, we have tried uh, what we call a kit model, where any obstetrician could collect the cord blood unit and mail it to us. Mm -hmm. But we found that generally the quality of those units collected were not as good and not many men, uh, met our storage criteria. So currently, we are not really doing what we call the kit model where you could donate anywhere in Houston and just mail, collect the blood and mail the kit to us. So, okay. uh, but that would be something to consider. In future, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Hopefully, uh, like in future, more and more hospitals start partnering yes. with such a great cause but right now we have seven hospitals i think almost mm -hmm. and if moms goes to any of those hospitals they are eligible for at least for the screening yeah so yeah, right yeah so uh is this something that moms can decide in the early stage of the pregnancy whether they will be eligible to donate or not so that they can make a decision if they want to donate in one of those hospitals Yes, they can make that decision. Um, we try to provide as much information as we can um, with the physicians. So the physicians, they have this conversation with their physician, usually around 36 weeks mm. of gestation. And at that point, no, normally the physician will let them know if they're eligible or they'll document it in their medical record. And then later on, when we're at, if we're at that hospital, we're able to see that they're interested in core blood donation and approach them, and then we ask additional screening questions. Also, a mom, our phone number is also on our website, um, and if they just want to know ahead of time, they can always give our bank a call, and one of our team members on site or on staff will be able to answer their questions. 
Okay, that is good to know. And uh, due to the COVID, are there any additional obstacles or it does it has not interfered with collection? Uh, yes, it has. Um, mainly only because we do a screening process before we proceed with any um, consent. And typically if the mother has been exposed or diagnosed or um, living with someone who has been positive within a certain time period, they would be excluded from the donation process. So, yeah, so and there are so many limitations, <laughs> right? But yes. They still yes. managed to collect. collect. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. so Good it, job, Judy. Yes, that is so great. And that's the reason Uncle had received <laughs> right? the transplant. Yes. And, in fact, I know another friend of mine, um, he received trans uh, umbilical cord transplant and now his baby is one year old oh okay. so if this these moms have not donated i things yeah, would I been know. different yes. so the the cord blood banking is so powerful donated but collected as well right collected like they as keep well. running into obstacles and they keep working through it like yeah yeah, yeah. so, that's so we need more and yeah. more ambassadors <laughs> right <laughs> Especially as uh, Harsha, our first guest, said that she feels bad that she was not mm -hmm. able to donate. But all these people um, who are not eligible in, uh, in that range to donate can be ambassadors, can provide information mm -hmm. to other new parents yeah. so that more and, people, more and more people get to know about it and can make at least yeah. informed decision. Absolutely. And they can check their eligibility and then they can reach out to. Mm -hmm. So is there any phone number that you would like to give us on this call? Yes, um, our corporate bank phone number is 713-563-8000. And again, we are always there Monday through Friday, eight to five, and someone is able to answer the phone. And either if the mom is interested in donating, we'll forward the information to our team members that are on site, or if they wanna just have, ask questions about it, Someone on staff is on staff to be able to answer any questions. Wow, that is so wonderful. So great to know that there are so many resources yeah. available. When you give a life, you mm -hmm. can actually give life to some stranger as well. Yes. Right. So, yeah, it's so great to know that you have that much power. It, a life gets saved, a cure from cancer. Cancer is something that you hear about it and you get goosebumps. And yeah. the cure lies, when you give birth to a child, you can give cure give. to cancer. That yes. is awesome. Um, that's so great. Uh, we really appreciate that you took time to share this valuable information with us. And um, really appreciate that. Yes, thank you for doing such great work and for such a good cause. Like we can just hear the passion in your voices and uh, we don't know where we'd be without y'all doing such such great work so thank you so much thank you thank you for having us all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. yeah what a great what a great like it's amazing how everyone just works together right and you keep working through it you keep working through that. You know, there is an old saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, yes. Yes, exactly. It takes a village. Yeah, somebody gives information. The Somebody provide that where to go. Check this available, whether you are eligible or not. Somebody else collect it. And then there's a, another network that pro that facilitates the uh, transplants. Right. So really it takes the whole village. I don't say it's a village, it's like a universe. I know, right? <laughs> it literally, because the whole global community is See, coming together for coming this together to save a life. So that's just so thrilling. I have yeah. like goosebumps, right? Seriously, <laughs> yeah. It's so, so powerful. and Thank so. you, guys, for everything you do, because look at her yeah. face. Like she is so like excited to talk about it and always sharing something such great information thank you so yeah. oh, for having me again yeah, of course. <laughs> and having another so important segment of life and hope and there are so many people who are still waiting for a match mm -hmm. and knowing that for the cord blood uh, even if it's not a perfect match it could be helpful yes that is a great resource it is so hard to find a matching donor mm -hmm. like for the blood cancer blood disorder patients uh, i've been working with this child her name is eva barad she has beta thalassemia and she receives blood transfusions every two weeks three weeks 
and for so many years she's waiting for a match has not found one perfect match mm -hmm. so patients like Eva the cord blood could be home yeah it could yes. be there and, and, and fortunately Eva has blood disease um, disorder only so she has that much time to wait but there are so many patients we come across uh, they don't have that much time. time yeah. For them, this could be literally life-saving mm -hmm. because they don't have time to wait and do more registration drives to look for a donor. If a cord blood is available, even if it is not a perfect, perfect match, match, maybe 90% yeah. match, yeah. it could save, save. their life. Yeah. So, I mean, the cord blood it's not just saving one life, they save the whole life. family. Yes, absolutely. Because child is, it's not just child's life, it's yeah. the parents, yeah. the whole family. Families, yes. So this is not saving one life, it is saving the family. family so we yeah. need more and more ambassadors. <laughs> yes, <yeah. laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you to all our listeners uh, for this amazing show. And we'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Bye-bye. <laughs>